Hello, everyone. My name is Samuel Waltz. I'm the treasurer of the Astronomy and Space Exploration Society, ASX, uh, which is co hosting this event with the Star Squad podcast. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Great. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank all of you for being here, everyone in the audience. I also want to thank our panelists for coming. Uh, some of whom drove and flew very long distances to make this event possible. We really appreciate that. Um, one panelist, unfortunately, who isn't going to be able to join us tonight is Professor Mark Kingwell. He would have uh, enriched our discussion of the ethical and philosophical side of Mars settlement. And it's a shame that he can't be here, but I think we have a, a very deep edge of opinionated experts in that regard anyway. So I think that's going to be good. Um, this event has actually been two years in the making since it's this very first inception when uh, Jessica Campbell and I, uh, who helped organize this event, uh, sat down with a few people from ASX and the Star Spot to uh, put together an event that we decided would be a panel discussion that would combine talk about uh, the logistics and the ethics of Mars settlement with a focus on terraforming. Talk about the logistics of Mars settlement is uh, reasonably common. You hear about uh, how we can get to Mars, what the best way is. Uh, you can't have enough of that sort of conversation, but it exists. And talk about the ethics of it is maybe less common, but that certainly exists too. Our idea was that we would have experts in both of those realms come together to have a conversation about the intersection of those two topics. So not just how can we get to Mars, not just should we get to Mars, but a combination, how should we get to Mars? Um, so, uh, I'm not going to be your moderator, I'm going to invite to the stage Justin Schlottier, uh, who actually, it's very nice that you can be here because uh, Justin runs the, the Star Spot podcast and also founded ASX, and he's the ideal person for an event that combines the two. Uh, he founded ASX when he was doing his bachelor's here at the UT in engineering. Um, he, uh, Served on the board of directors for the Canadian Space Society. Has been the uh, external director and editor in chief of the Canadian Space Gazette. And Justin also works with a national, a national educational charity called the uh, the Center for Inquiry to advance uh, critical thinking and scientific literacy. And Justin actually talks in the press pretty often about issues of free speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of uh, freedom of inquiry, and participates in debates and dialogues at Center on Ethics, Religion, and Politics. Before I call Justin to the stage, I want to know if you're going to hear a low rumbling throughout this evening. That rumbling is trains. It's not worms in the sand of the planet Dune. It's not the building falling around you. We're right next to the train station, and that's what that is. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to call Justin Chouchier to the stage.
Mars seems to be the appropriate uh, and best bet in that respect. That's certainly what you're going to be hearing tonight. But let's understand the job of terraforming and settling the red planet would arguably be the greatest challenge that we've ever taken as a species. Tonight, while we focus on what may sound like a purely technical inquiry, we will ultimately be asking some truly profound questions. For example, what is it that's so special about the Earth that makes it our home? What are the limits of the human body and mind, if there are any? Do we as a species so focused on our day-to-day -day concerns and so often polarized by political and ideological differences, do we really have the ability to come together globally to commit so many generations of work towards this kind of endeavor? And conversely, do we risk stagnation if we don't do this? And then, of course, there's the ethical concerns. If Mars harbors living organisms or even dormant life, do humans have the right to interfere in the natural course of that planet's evolution? But if Mars is instead barren, that has other perplexing questions, like how do you compare the value of preserving the natural beauty of Mars against the potential worth of bringing life to a dead world? And perhaps the most troubling question of all these for me is, can we seriously get through all of this by 9 o'clock tonight? <laughs> that one is my job. I'll take care of that. For all of you, I want you to make it your responsibility tonight to come up with your own opinions on this issue and perhaps be tantalized enough to do your own subsequent research. And I want you to reflect on what all of this means to us as individual members of a spacefaring, potentially spacefaring species. So here's how it's going to work tonight. We're going to have a short introduction. I'm going to give a short biography for each panelist. They're going to speak for about a minute. Um, to just kind of introduce themselves to you, give you a sense of where you're coming from on this. We're then going to have, over the course of the evening, two sections of conversation. And each section will consist of moderated questions from me and discussion among the panelists, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. The first half will be more so on the technical side of how we would do this, can we do this. The second section of questions will be more on the ethical side of should we do this, or how should we do this? Although I reserve the right to blend the two a little bit, because I think as we're going to learn, this is a very, very complicated series of questions, and there's really an intersection of ethical and technical and scientific questions that all kind of get rolled up into uh, some very complicated issues. So that's how things are going to work. Um, as I say, I will be moderating the first parts of both halves of tonight. I will start by directing a question to one particular panelist, I'll ask him or her to keep their answer as concise as possible, and then other panelists are certainly open to uh, adding in um, whatever they'd like to say. And there's also, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of ground to cover. There's going to be a lot of questions. We'll try to keep this flowing uh, rather quickly. So let's start with introductions. Our first panelist is Professor Paul Delaney. You can introduce Paul, and then Paul, will be ready to say a few words. Sure, perfect. Okay, so Paul received his, his Bachelor of Science, pardon me, from the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia, and his Master's of Science from the University of Victoria in BC. He worked as a nuclear physicist for Atomic Energy in Canada and was a, a support astronomer at the Broad Hill Observatory in Arizona. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University, where he is the Astronomical and Observatory Coordinator and he is director of the Division of Natural Science. Paul I've known for some time as a passionate educator who delights in discussing the wonders of the universe with people of all ages. He coordinates the extensive astronomy public outreach program and hosts the internet radio program York Universe at York University. He's been the recipient of York's Faculty of Science and Engineering Teaching Award, a top 10 finalist in TV Ontario's Best Lecturer competition, the recipient of the University-wide Teaching Award, the winner of the Royal Canadian Institute Sanford Fleming Medal, and the recipient of the Kailat Award, I hope I pronounced that right, You'll correct me if I didn't <laughs> from the Canadian Astronomical Society. So Paul, why don't you correct that pronunciation and then say what you'd like to say. But I think of myself as uh, an amateur astronomer, I love them by design, 
I certainly uh, have enjoyed reading science fiction, perfectly good science fiction, for as long as I can possibly remember. Growing up in the 60s, I thought I had nailed the timing for being able to you know, venture into some of those science fiction stories and to be able to stand on other planets. I realize now that that's just not quite going to happen uh, and that I will leave that to my children, I hope. During the 60s, I read a story called The Green Hills of Earth by Robert Heinlein. And the principal character there was, was a bard of the spaceways. And one of his poems has always uh, stuck with me. It took me a few lines long. I pray for one last landing on the globe that gave me birth. Let me, let, let me rest my eyes on the fleecy skies and the cool green hills of earth. Every time I look through my telescope, I see uncharted worlds and I transport myself there. It's a wonderful experience. But as I said, I fear that I will not personally be able to do that, to be able to stand off world. But I am certainly an advocate for humanity venturing to the stars, and the local neighborhood, the moon and Mars, are the obvious locations. I am sure that somebody in the not too distant future will recite those same words from the Green Hills of Earth. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate you keeping your statement to within a minute. I didn't think anybody would do that. Let's see if we can keep that going. Uh, allow me to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Olatha McIntyre. She received her Bachelor of Science in Biology at Dalhousie University. Her study of closed loop systems in the context of space colonization, which I'm sure we'll hear more about, inspired her to pursue astronaut training. After working as an onboard marine biologist in Alaska, she completed her Master's of Science in Space Sciences at the International Space University in France and co authored Vivisphere Mars. I think this time I got it right. Vivisphere Mars, Terraforming Meets engineered life adaptation. She received an internship at the world-class Controlled Environment Systems Research Facility at the University of Guelph, where she earned a PhD in Environmental Sciences. Dr. McIntyre. Thank you, Maybe June. 
Jupiter. I think we'll get to wherever we want to go. There is some really good practical scientists and engineers who are going to help us fulfill that journey. I've got some very strong ideas on what they're going to do to take us there. And uh, a little bit of a historical analogs to help uh, to help give some ideas on what we should be looking for. Uh, but again, I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a writer, I'm a practical guy. I hope that helps. I feel different than everyone else. <laughs> Massive Achievements Award. He's also a fellow of the American Association for the 
advancement of science has received both the Life Science Award from the International Academy of Astronautics and the NASA Exceptional Performance Award. An exceptional career. John. My brother would say, why can't you hold down the job? <laughs> we actually are at an amazing place in human history. Uh, and I, I think it bears some thinking about exactly how we want it to go in the future. Uh, in a hundred years, are you going to be able to look back and uh, think of this as an opportunity taken or an opportunity avoided, or maybe uh, a risk that was avoided? When uh, my colleagues at the SETI Institute uh, were first looking for little green men or big blue women, um, they were actually uh, usually posing the question, are we alone? Carl Sagan got a lot of mileage out of it, are we alone? And I always thought for a program that was looking across several thousand light years, that they ought to be a little bit more proactive. The real estate aspect of that question is, is there anybody else out there? Or do we already own it all? Uh, one of the things about moving out into the solar system is how are we going to behave when we get there? Uh, are we going to be in a position where we actually uh, recreate some of the uh, bad parts of Earth's history? Or can we do it in a more guided way? a more wise way, if you will. Uh, when we look at stewardship of outer space resources, outer space environments, we know that both protection and use are going to be invaluable to make those environments available to our progeny and to future generations. So we have to understand something about the scientific study of the worlds that we might want to inhabit, or the materials that we want to get from those worlds, uh, is a, a critical part of the future of humanity, as is an understanding of where we get food, water, and air here on this planet. I, early on in my career, I was in charge of uh, the Control Ecological Life Support System program at NASA headquarters, which sought to build uh, greenhouses that could actually support astronauts in space. And I had a spacecraft engineer tell me he would never want to live in an environment that was totally dependent on green plants for his work. And I said, well, where are you headed? You know, <laughs> he already lives there. Uh, we can do these things. We can envision terraforming. We can do a variety of other things. But stewardship has got to be our model. We've already taken the first steps in altering Mars to our way of thinking. Uh, and we've taken it in a way that we don't even understand yet. So we need to be very careful about going to the brink and finding out that we're already over that slope. So let's think about it and talk about it tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.
really a technological challenge in a very, very time. We have no indication that life exists on the surface, no definitive indication. There is lots of uh, methane readings which we're having difficulty to interpret. Is it biology? Is it geology? Uh, you know, we, we've not found anything that we can say categorically there is the signature for life. And we're looking very hard for those signatures, the current probes, the next generation probes, and so on. But there is nothing that says life is there at the moment. There is nothing that says life was there in the past. But we haven't found organic molecules. And as I said, there's a significant amount of water locked up short of permafrost. If you go back four billion years ago, the environment was significantly different. In fact, Mars was more habitable earlier on in the solar system's history than Earth was. And it is really not beyond the realm of credulity that you and I are all Martians. The panspermia brought life from Mars to here. But Mars' environment has changed primarily because of its small size, its solidifying core, and its lack of magnetic field. So, you know, maybe I should address them. That's sort of where we're at the Mars at the moment. Thank you. That was quite concise. I appreciate that. I want John uh, Grummel, perhaps, to pick up on that. Because I'm curious about, uh, Paul referred to recent discoveries about uh, uh, water on Mars. Can you explain why those are so important and relevant to today's debate? Uh, if I understand the question properly, um, the, the most important thing that you can get on Mars right now is ice, because that's where we're going to get not only rocket fuel, but what we need to sustain our ability to stay alive. It, the ice can provide radiation shielding, not just a perchlorate of dust that provides radiation shielding, but it's a very difficult thing to breathe uh, and not good for astronauts. Uh, we have the ability to envision uh, water under the surface, but we've never detected it. The Sharad and uh, other radar that's been there from Mars Express have not found large pools of water, in fact, no pools of water whatsoever under the surface, but they weren't specifically designed for that. If there were an underground aquifer, it would be a prime place to look for extraterrestrial life, i.e. Martians. Martians may live there, but we have to be very careful about how we deal with those environments because the last thing you want to do is put earth organisms there. We know that earth organisms can do nasty things to aquifers on the ground. And in fact, I have a, an image on my computer here of a paper written by some guys at the uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands called The Application of Bacteria as a Self-Healing Agent for the Development of Sustainable Concrete. They have a microbe they put in bags of concrete, and when they pour it out, if it gets a crack in it, they'll seal off that crack. But you can imagine how much fun it would be to try to pump the water out of an aquifer where earth microbes are sealing off all the cracks on a regular basis. So I think the, the water is key on Mars. Uh, we published uh, a paper back in November 2014 looking at what we call special regions on Mars, places where there might be enough water to support Earth organisms. Uh, and the temperatures on Mars can easily go high enough to support Earth microbial replication. The combination together hasn't been found, but we know that there are lichens on Earth that can live with only vapor water. We don't know if they can reproduce that. So we have to be very careful of what we put on Mars. Anybody else want to comment on that? In terms of the current state of our knowledge of Mars, in terms of water, in terms of present habitability, before we talk about changing all that. John? Uh, if I had to say something, I'd say I agree with you. We will receive it. Very well. Uh, I want to get each of you in turn to comment on a pretty um, sexy initiative called Mars One. Everybody's familiar with this, this idea, um, a Dutch-based initiative to establish a colony on Mars, um, a mostly a private venture, which would be partly funded through a reality TV concept, where the journey would be documented and folks would watch it and they'd make money by doing that. Um, I'm asking because a few of you have been in the news commenting on this, either in support of or uh, in criticism of Professor Delaney, I recall you having some questions about the feasibility of this 
project. Can you talk to us about what those concerns were? And I remember in those concerns you said that it wasn't completely far-fetched to colonize Mars, but that this was overly ambitious. What are some of the problems, some of the challenges to colonizing Mars, which this particular mission did not adequately address? As I said in my opening remarks, I'm certainly an advocate for the notion of colonization, although that's a bit of a loaded word, but certainly heading for other places and uh, establishing you know, uh, outposts there, colonizing it. Uh, the, the snag I see from Mars 1 is that uh, its, its budget line was probably somewhere between a factor of 10 and 100 too small. Uh, it was suggesting that they could get there with about a $6 billion price tag. I think that was definitely actually on the budget. I don't know why they said that. Put a bigger number there, people run away. Uh, Back, but to get to Mars on six billion dollars, even one way, they don't have a big problem with one way, as long as the one way participants are knowledgeable that it is a one way trip. But the, the amount of money that was available for this venture definitely was just not in my ballpark. The technology to get there while we are on the cusp of it, and I'm sure Chuck can speak more to that, uh, it's on the cusp. We don't have the technology to get people surface of Mars with a reasonable expectation that they will survive indefinitely on the surface. And I think it's unreasonable to send them there and say, three months later, I'm sorry, that's it, there's, that, that, you know, you're gone. Uh, that's not cool. So you've got to send them there with the technology to have a shot at survival indefinitely. Uh, Mars 1 had not gone that pathway. Getting to Mars is not easy. The radiation environment to Mars has not really been sorted out. Can't go back to the moon at the moment with people, let alone going to Mars. Have we had the technology to uh, reach the moon? Absolutely. I do believe the moon landing is good, just in case there's anybody out there. <laughs> um, so, you know, we can do it, but we can't at the moment. So, you know, there were just a whole lot of issues, a lot of them associated with technology and the survival of humans in this environment that Mars 1 just point blank had not addressed. So, it was, in my mind, very premature. I do think it will be a private venture that gets us there. I'd like to believe that it is a private venture that has a, a far-flung group that works with them, not just one particular group. I look at the International Space Station and think that that has been a very good model to get these 16 nations to work together in harmony uh, and to be able to you know, do good science and to show survivability, to develop the right technologies. But Mars One was just too short uh, and too close and just uh, inadequately well through at this point in time, in my view. Chuck? I do want to get Chuck to follow up on that. And Chuck's done a lot of work networking in the space industry, thinking about commercial uh, aspects of space. Do you think the kind of harnessing of, of entertainment is one way so that there could be kind of a financial driver? Can you also comment on, you know, is it going to be a private company that's going to do this? Is it going to be a private public partnership? How would we actually get off this planet and start this project of getting to Mars? You know, that's a, that's a perfectly sensible set of questions. I, I think it's important to note that back in the 1980s, I worked in television. And I think Boss Lansdorp and his Mars One team have a really good idea for a reality television show. <laughs> now, the problem with reality television show is we all expect that when The Bachelor takes Lauren, they will marry and they will live happily ever after. So you have to suspend your disbelief. And, and I think that while there's not enough money to actually get to Mars, there's certainly more than enough money to put on a really good television show. Uh, and I think that's what Last Line Store initially tried to do. Um, I wrote about Mars one once. I, I, I compared it to the Mel Brooks movie. Uh, the producers. Are you guys familiar with the producers? Uh, I, I think Mars One is, is, is very similar to that. Um, I think this goes to the, the literalness of, of some of the people uh, I know in, in the space industry or in engineering. They, they don't understand the real reasons why things are done that way. Uh, that's why the, uh, the space launch system in the U.S. costs so much money, because it's not really designed to launch anything into orbit 
or, or in the deep space is designed to keep NASA engineers employed until they retire in 10 years. Uh, but with that said and done, I, I, I do believe we are going to get to Mars. I do believe it's going to be a private corporation. Uh, and I think we have a certain historical thing we need to worry about. Um, I believe that the Apollo program was an anomaly. As a general rule, our best and our brightest don't go to explore strange new worlds. It's the younger children, the sons and daughters who don't inherit the family business who go explore it. It's the, uh, the people who can't get into the, uh, uh, who can't get tenure at university. It's the people who, 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 who don't fit in. It, it's the people who are like Columbus with this crazy idea of the great hundred parties and, and, and at some point, the Queen of uh, Spain gives him some money so that he goes away. <laughs> and because of that, uh, a lot of our, 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 our moral discussions uh, are, are going to smash up against the rocks of, of reality. If, if you're Pizarro and, and you're intent upon conquering Central America, you're, you're not going to think too much about morals. Uh, and, and that's why I think that a private company will, will conquer Mars and, and we'll still mess up. We'll do exactly what we've done in history. Uh, hopefully we'll get better. Hopefully we'll get smarter the second time around. But, but historically, this is what happened. People want to make a quick buck. Want to go to Mars? The people who want to who, who want to go down in history, they go there, they come back, and they go on parades forever. And, and that's what I think is going to happen. I'm going to bring to Professor Pauli. Can I just ask a short question? I'm just wondering what the best and brightest do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely positive there are people who are up at this table with me. <laughs> 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 Professor Pauli, uh, I'm pretty sure Elon Musk would disagree with your uh, definition of best and brightest. But I will point out, I just came back from the Caribbean cruise about a month ago, and the other group that goes exploring are retirees. <laughs> <laughs> They're all over the place, believe me, thousands and thousands of them. But I will tell you that I don't think that they're going to go to Mars. The moon is a great place for retirees. And once it's gravity, short trip to get there, all the excitement, none of the pain. <laughs> Well, let me talk to Mike and Professor Rommel. Are you the planetary protection advisor for Mars One? Well, when Mars One came along, I was advised by some of my colleagues in the Netherlands that they were worth talking to. And Baz had a good idea for a reality TV show. I realized that part of the script was going to be written by people who didn't really know a whole lot about what I did at the time, both astrobiology and planetary protection. So I offered to be an advisor to them on astrobiology and planetary protection, and they accepted. Um, it's one of those things that if you're going to go to Mars, or even if you're not going to go to Mars, uh, you should do it right. Uh, I think that they're bringing out all kinds of issues. I would point out that, in my opinion, the MIT study on the life support system was ill-founded, and the conclusions were wrong. Um, there are lots of life support system jokes we can tell, but I won't do it now. Thank you. I do want to ask Professor Karach a question on this because Chuck's, of course, reminded us that these are real people, right? That would, real men and women that would go uh, representing those species on a mission like this. And if you look at Mars 1 as an example, you have a very small number of people who are going a very, well, a very large distance away. They're going to be alone and they have no hope of returning. Can, can you speak to the concerns we would have? in terms of how these people would govern themselves without any kind of authority or you know, central government being close by to make sure that they follow the law, follow the rules, well, what might happen? Yeah, that's a huge question. I mean, we're uh, chatting a little bit about this before, and uh, so I don't know how much in, in detail that you, that you want me to, uh, uh, to explore this. I was actually thinking about this question, and uh, um, I mean, you know, seriously, before uh, I came here, and I, maybe I'll just respond by asking another question. Talk about this, but I mean, for me, this is a really intriguing thing. I mean, human beings being what they are, you know, it's not just the conquest of material sources and so on. How do we live there? But I'm going for human beings with consciousness and emotions and desires and so on. And so, you know, how does that work out? Um, I just want to read something I might never You know, I'm a political theorist, so I've got lots of reading material here. And I read um, uh, another colleague of mine, a big fan of Kim Stanley Rock.
Robinson. And actually, um, you had mentioned that, that, you, uh, that you had been on, in some kind of collaboration with him. Uh, but anyway, I have a friend, Timothy Robinson. He said, you, some of you may know this, he wrote these three great and much celebrated novels, uh, The Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. And uh, there's an article in the New Yorker in 2013 claiming this is our greatest political novelist. And the, the article talks about this science fiction. But a lot of what I'm hearing is, you know, there's overlaps with this. And anyway, something that, uh, that the reviewer, his name is Kim Kreider, said is very interesting. And he said, anybody who is interested in these kinds of questions, um, uh, and he puts in here science fiction writers and also people interested in the exploration of Mars, are inherently liberal. And he doesn't mean like big L liberal, but small L liberal. The people who are interested in exploring Mars, really, they're, they're interested in utopian worlds. They're interested in the possibility of something that's better than we are. Uh, and the possibility of setting up a community that, that is, you know, I mean, if not nirvana, it's, it's going to be better. And you know, there's this hopefulness in human beings that when you reach out to new territories, um, that you're going to be, a, something better will happen. And I think this is true of colonization in the 16th and 1700s. Um, you know, you mentioned the explorers. I wouldn't call them the losers that you do. <laughs> I, I think that, um, that this is, uh, this for me is a, when I, the discourse and sort of reading up, you know, before I came on this panel, this is a big part of the, uh, I would say the kind of erotic, in the classical sense, the erotic drive for wanting these new territories. So, um, that doesn't really answer your question, but it's something I would like to explore more. Like, what, how do we want to live there? What, why, why do we want to go there? What is it about being human that we think, you know, we can do better there than we can do here? So, sorry, that's just a lot more questions. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love questions. I mean, I've got like 50 of them here. So we're going to do But we will return to some of those topics um, that Professor Bradshaw has raised. We've got some good fun talking about Mars one. It's, it's an interesting sort of case study. But I, let's, let's get more into the nuts and bolts of this. I want to talk about the science and technology of getting to Mars and, and possibly even terraforming Mars. I want to bring Dr. McIntyre. I want you to tell us a little bit about the main attributes of Mars that are problematic, shall we say, right now, that we might need to be thinking about modifying if we have any hope of having life or even human life come to that planet. Well, I think um, Paul really touched on that already. One thing that didn't um, come up was why liquid water doesn't survive on the surface of Mars, um, even though Mars is warm enough. And um, that's because of sublimation. So the pressure on Mars is low enough, the air pressure is low enough, that when that water comes up to the surface, it immediately sublimates, it turns into a gas immediately. And that's why we don't have liquid water on the surface of Mars. And that is one of our biggest challenges with living there, is that there's, there's not an atmosphere to speak of. Um, there are ways we can help build up our atmosphere. Um, I know in the description of some of the questions we might be asked, there was a discussion of what kind of climate should we create on Mars? Like, you know, what kind of humans should it suit in tropical or, you know, kind of going that direction. And we really wouldn't get to choose about that. Like, we could just make it a little bit better for us. <laughs> you know, like a little more habitable by increasing the air pressure a little bit more. Um, so we, there are resources there that we do have the frozen poles. So if we can find a way to like increase the, their albedo, we might be able to create a bit of a, a runaway greenhouse effect that we might be doing here on Earth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, we are doing that. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, we know as the polar ice caps, like, as that ice is receding and melting, the darker ground is exposed. And then there's more heating, and then there's more melting, and then it's a runaway effect. So that's happening on Earth, and that is something we might want to have happen on Mars. So you've got temperature issues, you've got atmosphere issues, are there others? Anybody there's else? the radiation environment. Radiation as well. Um, that's huge. So on Earth, we have magnetosphere. I don't know if you guys have seen images of it, but it's amazing. <laughs> we have this, this magnetic, these magnetic fields around the planet, and that's actually what's responsible for our, our northern lights. Borealis, that's where the solar wind is continuously blasting the planet actually gets funneled um, in by these magnetic fields and interacts with our atmosphere. And it's, it's gorgeous. Well, Mars doesn't have that anymore, that magnetic shielding that Earth has from that incredibly powerful solar wind. 
So it is literally getting blasted. And that would also frustrate our terraforming efforts because as we create atmosphere, it's going to get blasted off again. So <laughs> we'll have to work that out. And um, I don't know, I think Paul knows more about the radiation environment than I do. Do you know I did work on a, a Mars space, in a Mars space workshop at the European Space Agency, and there was a young woman there who was doing her PhD on the radiation environment on the surface of Mars. And what she was saying was that we were a little more worried about it than we actually should be. She said, um, you know, a few inches of shielding, uh, our habitat was glass. We, we made glass out of the regolith, and she was saying, you know, if it was about that thing of glass, we'd be doing pretty, pretty well in terms of our radiation protection. So I don't think that's an insurmountable issue, because we'd probably be underground a lot. Professor Domini's gravity an issue. Bigelow Aerospace to the 
years ago, the inflatable habitats was, was pitched as something that could put together really neat, uh, quick tents for, for marshes. You could have a good level effect, you could put something in between the levels, you could have some radiation perspective, uh, protection. And, and the really neat thing about Bigelow Habitat is that the cloth material is made by an engineer out of Vancouver, a Canadian. Uh, and, and he used to be a mountain climber, uh, and he developed his expertise in making materials because he wanted warmer ski jackets to climb Everest. And, and what happened was he fell off Mount Everest. He, he fell 20, 30 feet, he broke his back. Uh, he convalesced for six months in the hospital, and he had nothing better to do with a computer in front of him, so he applied for a NASA grant. And, and that's, that's one of my favorite stories about Canadian innovators doing really neat things that will help us explore Mars. I think the uh, most realistic way to uh, start terraforming Mars uh, is probably in the generation of greenhouse gases from Martian materials, and you just wait till the ozone uh, and combination of other gases uh, turns into a greenhouse layer and then you have a feed for it based on the normal Martian cycle. Mars actually every 50,000 years starts pointing its poles towards the sun and you get a lot more precipitation on Mars than we're aware of today. But I should point out that the Canadian result from the Phoenix mission on Mars is that it does snow on Mars today. Nobody's ever seen it fall uh, partially because of the sublimation issue that was mentioned earlier. Uh, but we know that it does actually hit the ground. We just don't turn on our spacecraft at night in the right places at the right time. So snow on Mars is one thing. The other combination of things that preserves ice on Mars is dust. Because the dust layer on top of the ice, you can see it here you know, as we transition from winter to spring, the parts of the snow that last longer are the ones that are all dirty by the day. Uh, it's a natural insulator, and in fact, there are places on the very tallest mountains on Mars, uh, Olympus Mons, Mons Mons, etc., where you can still see hanging glaciers, probably desiccated now, because they still have the form of ice pack, uh, as they were the last time Mars put its poles towards the sun 50,000 years ago. We don't know how much ice is left behind by those glaciers now. We'd have to go. We think that from the radar results, that the ones on the tallest mountains are desiccated, uh, but the ones on the shorter mountains don't appear to be. It's a myth, however, that liquid water can't exist on the surface of Mars. It just doesn't last very long. Um, it will evaporate. Uh, we have the ability to have Martian water. Uh, of course, we're not looking for pure water most of the time now, uh, based on results from the high-rise camera and from the other instruments on Mars and Trans Observer, we know that salty water is flowing on Mars today. How salty? Don't know. Can't tell you if those organisms are living there, but I can tell you that it's putting out a nice briny crust, and I wouldn't want to go walking on that uh, without being very careful that somebody could pull me out of a hole that I broke through. <laughs> Nothing could get into Leningrad. 
it doesn't work very well. You can put thermite on ice, and what you have at the end is a nice little puddle on top of the ice. <laughs> I think whichever oh, last word. Sorry, last word. Sorry. Uh, I think whichever way you go to the notion of terraformation of Mars, and I agree with Chuck, that's not going to be high on the original initial agenda. You are talking thousands of years. None, none of the processes that have been realistically applicated, and I certainly underscore the word realistic, uh, have got the possibility of transforming the Martian environment to something that is even remotely habitable from your size perspective, walking down beside the river or the lake and so on. That is thousands, tens of thousands of years in the future. We haven't even talked and spoken about the cost of doing that sort of thing. If you try and do it slowly as um, you know, was being suggested here, uh, and let the environment you know, just sort of kickstart the environment, trying to have it somewhat naturally just a little bit of poking from our side, that at least with a chance of being sustainable in the long term, but and, and uh, fairly resource neutral. But the timelines involved are not quite as strong, but they are certainly significant. So don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a quick note. Um, the, the master's project that we worked on, there were 24 of us um, sort of collaborating on that document and came up with a couple you know, different approaches to terraforming that we could take simultaneously. So one of them was super greenhouse gas, like chlorofluorocarbons, um, you know, using that to start things. But so our consensus that was that, yeah, it would be on the order of thousands of years. So you would just you know, see gradual improvements where it, it wanted to kill you less. Over time. <laughs> <laughs> so, for the time, there may actually be a complementarity uh, that we haven't realized before. One of the reasons to terraform Mars is for people there is to preserve the knowledge of the civilization that we have in case a large asteroid happens to come here and wipe us out. During that thousands of years that you're waiting for Mars to be good outside, all the hackers on the inside could be downloading the databases for Earth. <laughs> um, I, I don't think we're going to go to Mars to preserve life on Earth. We're going to go to Mars to, to find gold. We're going to go to Mars to, 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 to gain fame and fortune. Uh, it'll be generations after we settle into the Martian civilization when we decide we want to uh, protect Earth and, and, and turn little pieces of Earth into a museum on Mars. Okay, we're going to open this up to about a 10-minute uh, Q&A uh, from all of you, so if you have questions. And as I explained earlier, this is the first half and the second half, and we'll dive more into the ethics. So try to keep your questions more on the science and technology, but we're not going to censor anybody. Right? I think I saw a hand. You're a hand first, right? Yeah, that's a quick one. Um, the fact that we have life on here, why do we apply the great equation to life on Mars? I just, I just watched that documentary. <laughs> <laughs> trying to remember. I think he thought it was pretty lengthy. Um, what was he saying? One in 1,000 habitable planets would probably have life. The numbers we have based on the stars, the number of planets, the number of stars, the number of planets, the number of stars, the number of stars, the number of stars, the number of stars, How likely is it that given the right circumstances, life, that there will be genesis? And that was one of the uncertain, uncertain parts of that equation. And so if we were to find life on Mars, that would really let us know that the likelihood of finding life on other planets is, is dramatically increased. Because if there was, and it indeed is a separate genesis from, from what led to us. We're, we're still looking at around Yeah. Yeah. The Drake equation for those folks who might know it is a way of thinking about the possibility of life in our galaxy in the universe. And I first obviously came up with Drake, like Frank Drake, in and around 1959. But it is just a way of trying to conceptualize the problem to have a series of variables. 
arguably the most important piece of information that has arisen over the last few years has come out of the Kepler satellite that has found, give or take a bit, 5,000 exoplanets or exoplanetary candidates. And the statistics based upon the finds of that satellite suggest that every single star in the Milky Way galaxy has a planetary system. And so one of the biggest question marks in Drake's original equation was, you know, how common are planets? We are now quite confident that we're talking about a hundred billion planetary systems. The data from Kepler further suggests, based upon the Earth or super-Earth finds to date, that one in six planetary systems will have an Earth-like planet. It doesn't mean life, it just means in the habitable zone, comparable in size to the Earth or super I, I like numbers. I mean, if, if one in six has got the real estate upon which life could survive, that puts it in and around 15 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way alone. I guess I am of the view that those statistics are pretty good that life has managed to gain foothold elsewhere. Life is we know. Oh, I'm going to go with life, yes, okay. carbon-based life, I'm not necessarily any kangaroos or beavers, but I mean, you know, I am being life has managed to, to gain a foothold in this place. A lot of real estate out there, and that is one very big difference to uh, uh, Drake's original population 60 years ago. There were quite a few hands, I think yours was next. Yes? Um, just when you talk a lot about um, sort of the logistics of like how we once actually on Mars, what, how long would it take, A, like, ex, like expedition from Earth to Mars, and B, what's the likelihood of survival of um, that trip, just going there, we touched upon this before, but like, what are the hardships, and how would the astronauts be trained? Yeah. It, it takes about six to seven months to get to Mars. Okay. Um, and depending on the rocket, you have uh, Franklin Chen Diaz, you know, has a basimeter, but he thinks he can get there faster. When you get there, you have a choice. You can stay 30 days and come right back, uh, in which case it takes another six or seven months to come back. I think it's straight 500 days. And 500 days is, of course, you know, um, one of those things that is pretty daunting because anybody who gets to Mars for the first time is going to realize that. Two most hated words in the English language are absentee landlord. You're going to be living in a habitat that somebody else provided, and it wasn't ever tested on Mars. So that's a, a daunting position. All of the testing that's going to go in uh, for the hardware is going to be duplicated many times over with the people. So what we're looking at right now is uh, in something that we formed a long time ago, it's called the Antarctic Space Analog Program. Since that time, NASA astronauts have been training actually more in the Canadian North uh, than anywhere else, in forming groups. They've been uh, working underwater, uh, in underwater habitats, in a program that take place in called NEMO, which is always interesting. And they've been doing simulations of long-duration missions in different places, including long-duration missions. One of the hardest things for people to do is to figure out how to get a group together that can work together. Um, back in the uh, you know, late 1980s, there was a book that came out and suggested that experienced expedition leaders are pretty good at picking teams that will work together. Psychologists working under the direction of experienced expedition leaders were second best. And people could be selected using a multiple choice test. And that was the worst way to select them. And they advocated that more money be put into improving the multiple choice test. <laughs> that was a wonderful thing. Uh, what we did instead was to build up the cadre of people that actually went on that tradition. So you don't have that sort of thing going on. You have to be able to live in a box for a while and not mind it. You have to be able to not smell everybody else around you. Because the one thing we know about closed environments is that they smell pretty bad if somebody is just coming in for the first time. You've got to be able to understand that the procedures that you follow are there to protect your life and not go bonkers. I mean, people in Antarctica and the lower winter sometimes want to go running around at night, you know, in the buff, 
the end of the pipes. You can't do that on own. Um, so you're going to have to basically go for the kind of people who are maybe really boring to be around, but they'll actually come back, as opposed to people who are kind of all over the place and who won't come back. So it, it's not going to be the most exciting trip. Uh, we don't, you know, I think that if you watch the film, slightly dated now, it's still a good one from the psychosocial standpoint, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Those other sea water cannons astronauts picked to be the most boring people that could be found. So they wouldn't mind that long trip to Saturn. To Saturn or Jupiter. I'm just going to say Chris Hatfield is not boring. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a celebrity. <laughs> Plays the guitar. I was going to add that it, it's one thing to do study. Studies are really important. They give you a baseline to begin with. Uh, but there, there will be so many things you won't know until you actually show up. Uh, long duration ocean voyages. Who would have thought? But I didn't see. Who would have thought? Uh, and, and there will be a lot of those non trivial problems we will have to deal with when we go out there. Uh, I would also argue that. Structure of, of, of the future astronaut tour. There are analogies in history with, with submarine crews in World War II. And I would also argue uh, the modern command structure in the Royal Navy developed in the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th century as a result of long duration ocean voyages. And there's lessons that can be learned there as well. Yes. Oh, I was just thinking you take a lesson from the Franklin expedition. Um, the most, I think, plausible explanation about why they all died is that they didn't know that the tin cans of the food they had were lined with lead, and they all died of lead poisoning. Very trivial thing. Good questions. Um, okay. Yeah, so most of the panelists have touched on the, the human aspects of exploration and all the challenges that we'll face. And we're training for that already. We sent astronauts underwater to the Nemo uh, research station to live there in a very isolated environment. But what about nutrition? We haven't actually talked about that. Um, I know that the University of Guelph is doing some collaborations with the uh, German Space Agency, and we're planning to send some, some of these um, greenhouses to Antarctica and actually grow plants in there to see if they can actually survive in a deep space environment. But uh, do you think, um, I just want to hear your opinion, that astronauts that go one day to Mars uh, will transition into, and you may sound absurd to you, but into a vegetarian type of diet, and they will have to live like that in the long term, once we're actually capable of terraforming? Thank you. Sorry, Matt, you're very good. Shut down.
space voyages, I happen to think that the first thing we'll be able to, the first thing we'll, we'll spend a lot of time and effort into developing for a long duration Mars mission will be, will be somebody in the crew will figure out how to build a still. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, so I think we're going to eat meat. I think we're going to eat much of what we do now. But you know, we never, there's so many things we didn't know about until we went to other places. Uh, and, and, and I think the future will be a combination of what we have now and what we find when we get out there. When I, when I led a team of uh, U.S. people who were working with the Soviet Union to understand life support systems and what we could do in the future together. And they had the Air Station, we were talking about the International Space Station, uh, what turned out to be the International Space Station. And the first meeting we had was in Moscow, and at the lunch break, a water expert from NPO Nikimov, who makes the life support gear for the Russian Space Agency at the time, came up to me and he goes, what do you do about the alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> and to replicate this, I said, oh, we don't allow alcohol in space. He goes, yes, but they will always get some. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. 
back to the second half of the dice conversation. So to try to make up time, uh, we're going to uh, condense the moderated conversation into 10 15 minutes, and I'll ask my panelists to continue with the concise responses as much as possible, and then we'll go quickly to the audience. So let's talk about the ethics of terraforming and colonizing Mars. There are sort of three possibilities here, I think. Mars may be dormant, may have life that's dormant. Um, with the right conditions, perhaps that life can be um, awoken. Uh, it might, Mars may be barren. Uh, Mars may, although I think we heard from panelists, this is unlikely, have active life uh, currently, perhaps below the surface. I want to start uh, with Professor Bradshaw here. Let's imagine that there is uh, no current or past life, and so Mars is, is a barren surface. It's a barren world. Can you help us to understand how we would weigh the value of preserving a natural world against the value of bringing life to a dead world? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Okay. The, um, uh, yeah, that's a very important question about uh, the colonization of Mars and some of the Mars have had up with these questions. I think, you know, again, I, I just think that, you know, what are our human concerns? So the question that you asked me is framed in terms of ecological or ecological concerns about preserving this native habitat versus how would we approach something that we perceive as barren. And, you know, these are questions that we have on Earth. So right now, I mean, you see this contest between the appropriators, people who see uh, their existence as appropriation versus people who think that their son has to be some respect in the natural habitat between, for example, entrepreneurial capitalists, like on my left here, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Aboriginal people. So it's the same kind of laundry, which is interesting. So the discourse in the, the previous section was interesting to me, uh, that there is a, you know, partially a discourse of, of, uh, of conquest. So we're talking about this, uh, uh, earlier, um, and I was mentioning that I had just finished teaching John Locke, um, the 17th century British theorist, who is really the cornerstone of our uh, parliamentary democracy, representative government, and so on. And it's almost, you know, the human beings have these conceptions of how they see things, and in Locke's view, uh, is that uh, you get to own whatever you mix your labor with. That's the, the original principle of ownership. Uh, so as soon as you begin to mix your labor with a territory, it belongs to you. And then, of course, you get quarrels between people fighting over how much labor you put into it and how you appropriate it and so on. And for Locke, that's the origin of government, the origin of sovereignty. You need government to adjudicate these disputes between people who naturally appropriate property. So some of the discourse about around the Solomon of Mars is precisely about this. And we were talking about this before. I mean, who's, who's going to go there? If they go there, do they have a right to it? Uh, we have inter we have international bodies that would adjudicate this, or if you're the first person here and you get to dig up the soil and put your big tent on there, um, and uh, and you're dull, boring people living in it, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, does that mean that you own Mars? I mean, these are questions that we've been grappling with for centuries about ent entitlement, sovereignty, and so on. Um, and uh, and on the other side of that, you know, so that's when you know I see this as, as a dominant discourse in the in the Mars settlement um, issues. And on the opposite side is that the uh, the question about the nurturing and leaving alone the environment. Um, you know, what would that uh, what would that amount to? The respect for uh, a life form that we are not going to oppose. It seems to me that if we really respect. If we really believe that, we would abandon any project like this whatsoever. As I mentioned in my opening comments of the reference to um, kind of our end of the technological argument, I don't see that there's any way around this that the idea to go out into Mars and explore and so on and settle is, a, is an anthropomorphic obsession. It's a human desire to conquer. Yeah, I, I do want to ask uh, Professor Rommel to comment on that, as well as on the other possibility, or the other possibilities, which is that there is life, either there's dormant life, or there's even active life. You've worked in planetary protection. If, if that's the case, that Mars isn't being dead, <laughs> is that, does that make this discussion a non-starter? Or are there ways to kind of work around that? Yeah, I, I think in a case we made earlier, the uh, rocking against Bermuda, uh, maybe uh, the origin of life on Earth, and that uh, our ancestors lived on Mars and are still living there under the surface. <coughs> we have this idea that somehow we're going to go to Mars and we're going to terraform it, 
and turn it into an Earth just like the one we're living on now, uh, without the you know, inconvenience of displacing anybody we know and love. Um, but in fact, we don't know enough to even approach that subject because if there is life on Mars, and we try to push Mars into a, a terraform of Mars, they may push back. Uh, we are appallingly ignorant about the process of how Mars works. We are appallingly ignorant about whether or not there's Mars life under there or actually making it work that way. Uh, and I, I think that we have to be very careful about proceeding in our current state of ignorance. One of my favorite Bart Simpson cartoons is one where he's standing at the blackboard at the beginning of the show, writing down, science class should not end in tragedy. <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, that is the kind of thing that planetary protection tries to make, you know, variable, um, make it true. If we're going to study Mars using robotic spacecraft, eventually humans, we need to do that scientifically in a way where we preserve the knowledge that Mars, of how Mars works today. Then we can make decisions on how to terraform, etc. The late Carl Sagan bet me at one point in time that NASA would never put out a NASA research announcement about planetary engineering. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, post his uh, passing, uh, I won the bet. <laughs> because we actually put out something like that, planetary engineering. The unfortunate thing was that it was planetary engineering of this planet and not of Mars. Dr. Rackenmeyer, I want to get to you. It, it certainly wouldn't be a tragedy. Oh, oh sorry, Chuck. I can see your hand. Uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, for reference, one of Leia's points directly, uh, the difference between exploration and conquest. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that I've never been here before. I came around tonight. Uh, I've had a good time up until now. <laughs> and I haven't tried to conquer anybody. <laughs> hey, where's my computer? <laughs> yeah. uh, so I don't think it necessarily follows that exploration needs to conquest. Uh, and that's my point. Hmm. Anybody else want to weigh in on what could be a place today before I ask some questions? I, I carry on my arms at this moment. <laughs> All right, I'll take the hit. Um, the question about contaminating Mars, it would certainly be a tragedy, as has been suggested, if we contaminated or obviously destroyed the native life on Mars. But I, I want to I better understand if that's inevitable. If we do go about terraforming Mars, is there a way to modify parts of the planet and still preserve native life so that we can study it, so that that life can be preserved for its inherent worth? That's a really good question. And something I have thought about that people do think about, I mean, there's um, plans for habitats where the spacesuits never come inside. They're sort of there's sort of a lock, and they're they're locked to the outside of the half. So you you climb into it, and you know it seals behind you, and then you go and you come back and decontaminate your back. Because there's issues too. Like there's a slight possibility we could pick something up from the surface. So people are concerned about that kind of contamination both ways. Um, from what I know of microbes, it could be inevitable. We, we may have already done it. Even though we build our spaceships in clean rooms and we try really hard, but we we can only culture about one percent of the bacteria that are living on Earth. So we we don't really know what how many microbes might have already gotten there. And I think I think by going there, it's a huge risk. Yeah, that we that we've been contaminating. Um, that being said. I still want to go. Um, the erotic impulse you were talking about earlier is, is incredibly strong, even though I, I really respect you know, other, other life and other life forms, and I would definitely take all precautions that I could um, to practice safe exploration of Mars. Um, I still don't know. Did you want to get to the polls? Well, I was, I was going to say, let there be no mistake, we have contaminated Mars. Yeah. Uh, you know, there have been dozens of spacecraft that have landed calmly, not so calmly, <laughs> onto the surface of Mars already, and that has been going on since you know, the 1960s. So, all of our best efforts at decontamination, there is no doubt that we have taken bird life to Mars. Has it survived? Don't know. Uh, but, 
if extremophiles on this planet tell us anything, I would put another wager out there uh, that, in fact, when we finally do get to Mars and we start analyzing the surface, I suspect that the first life we find will be the stuff that uh, we've already taken. First of all, did you want to get to that? Well, just as a rejoinder, you know, we, taking microbes to Mars doesn't mean that it's contaminated. One of the things that we know about Earth microbes is that they really hate ultraviolet radiation. And they go there, they're locked in their spacecraft, like they land, reflected in other ultraviolet radiation, basically kills off anything left on the outside of the spacecraft. That was a change from the previous implementations that were practiced uh, by the Soviets, as far as they said, and by us, because I have pictures and I know people who did it, where we actually took the entire spacecraft of the two Viking landers, and we put the landers in a aluminum casserole dish, effectively, they call it a bioshield, and baked it in an oven for 54 hours, so that every part of the spacecraft reached over 111.7 degrees Celsius for more than 30 hours, as the way to kill off all the spores that they worried about, and all the vegetative organisms as well. Those two missions were done in 1975, <coughs> launched 75, landed in 76. We're about to have the 40th anniversary of Viking. Uh, I encourage you all to come to Hampton, Virginia, and find out about that. Uh, but effectively, they did a very good job. We realized later on, however, that Mars was not so clement, and that there are microbes uh, on the outside that would die fairly quickly. That doesn't mean that they can't survive and they can't eventually come out if it gets all wet and cushy on the surface. But it does mean that inside the warm electronics boxes of the landers that the U.S. has sent there anyway, we have microbes, but they're not going anywhere, but they're not growing. So I have a question sort of for all of you, and it's part science question, part ethical question, and that is if there is dormant life on Mars, and it will remain dormant unless we do something on Mars, um, is it feasible from a technical point of view to bring that life out of its dormant state? And would it be ethical to do that? To give it new life where it isn't active in its, its current state? Who wants to take either aspect of that question? Well, we just do it more. Sure, we can do it more. Thank you all. Alright, we're going to get to all here. It is an ethical. I, I can see uh, a plaque out of earth microbes going by the Martian microbes being treated differently. Earth microbes. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess I will be controversial potentially and say I don't have an ethical problem with that. Um, you know, if we do find microbial life on Mars, trying to understand it so that we can either coexist or at least survive its uh, engagement with humanity. Uh, is, is rather important. So if we find it, can we uh, can we uh, revitalize it? If we can, so be it. We learn from it. So I have no issue with, with uh, going at microbes on that. Um, I really look to Chris McKay on this. You know him as well. And um, one thing that he talks about is our, our garden. Gardening instinct. So as human beings, we uh, we have a tendency towards stewardship towards nurturing, towards growing things, you know, ideally. And um, and he feels like this is sort of the approach we would take with Mars, if like we would want to nurture it and, and promote life there. So Martian life or you know ours eventually if we could. But I think the main thing, I mean we're scientists. Well <laughs> I mean I feel like science is really driving the exploration of Mars and, and coming at it from a scientific perspective, we would really want to be able to study what's there, what's happening there, and, and what's going on with that. And, and if there are microorganisms there, and I think there's a, a good chance that there could be, if there is briny, I mean, there is that bit of briny water on the surface that before, you know, um, it's salty enough, it doesn't sublimate right away, it's very cool. And Chris McKay, again, he was studying the, the desert in Atacama, and he found microbes living in these, like, salty rocks and layers, um, they're called endolites, so they live in rock rock concrete to the greenhouse for them. And that's the sort of life that we might find on Mars. And I, I wouldn't doubt that it's there. So I think our first step is, is that exploration to try to contaminate, trying to see what's there, and, and then gardening.
I have a strong moral predilection towards life. I believe that life uh, is precious. If we have an opportunity to revive life be on Earth or, or on Mars or encourage life, uh, I, I'm all for that. I think if we could uh, revive a, a Martian oncology from, from billions of years ago, I'd be up for that as well. Uh, but with that said, uh, I'm not sure I'm in the majority here. And I remember watching Frankenstein last month on uh, Turner Classic. So it's, it's a very difficult problem. Um, well, I, what I would say is that, uh, you know, from a lifetime of studying uh, philosophy and political philosophy, is that there's absolutely no definitive way to make a claim about what human nature is. There's no way of proving that. It's not an empirical question. And uh, so there are some people who would say, yes, we're natural gardeners, and there, you know, there are lots and lots of political philosophy built on this premise, and then there are people who argue, famously Thomas Hobbes in the 1600s, uh, that human beings are uh, by nature warlike and competitive and engaged in power, struggle for power after power that ends only in death. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so um, these are the uh, this is the ethical uh, you know the ethical questions before us. But so there is no definitive account of, of, of human nature that we can ever point to. It's not a materialist question. It's a question of what human beings are teleologically capable of. So hence, I just come back to this issue that any issue of a uh, settlement of Mars or space exploration or whatever has to face this question. There's no, um, there's no necessary reason why human beings would behave well in space or any better than they do on Earth. And to behave well requires political and ethical organization and the artifice of what it is to be human. I should start this by saying, give you the money. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I actually think that these questions were something that Kim Stanley Robinson did very well with in his Mars series, Red Green and the Blue Mars. And the fact is that Mars is a big planet. Even though it's half the diameter of Earth, it's only the full size on the surface as all the land area on Earth. So there are many different things that can happen. It also has uh, some splendid volcanoes, uh, three times the height of Mount Everest uh, in the case of Mons and uh, There are a variety of different environments available on Mars now. Some of them are very, very uh, lacking in atmosphere. And one of the things that Stan did was he provided a refuge for Martian organisms or Martian environments on the slopes of these mountains. So he actually thought through the process of how you would form a planetary park that would preserve old Mars as well as the new Mars that was being chained below. Uh, and I thought that was a, a nice you know, kind of mix of what you could do on a place like Mars. If you decided you needed a second home for humanity, then our sympathy to Martian microbes could still be engendered by giving them planetary parks on the slopes of the uh, Darsus Volcanoes. All right, I'd like to take you back to the audience now. We uh, will have our second uh, audience Q&A session. It's great. Um, I wrote my question out so I can say it So to me, space exploration has actually brought a lot of people 
people together, lot of nations together, that otherwise wouldn't go together. And so Mars 2016 launched on Monday. Uh, the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Federation working together. Uh, it's rather encouraging given the fact that they have a bit of difficulty on the ground sorting some of those things out. But going forward into space, they seem to be able to put those sorts of things aside. Many of the astronauts who have worked at the International Space Station have commented on the fact that they are astronauts first and foremost, relying on each other to survive a hostile environment. And you know, those geographical lines, which you can't see from orbit, tend to disappear for the astronauts. So I guess, and maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I'm hopeful that space exploration can actually teach us something or two about getting on. So one of the things I find, I mean, somewhat probably not sure if it's related, but it's kind of a bit kind of maybe coincidental how scientific revolution and most of modern science has been largely driven, originated from Europe, and most of the major conquests, conquering of new territory are also done by Europeans. So is there kind of that correlation between like science and the need to conquer new ground, whether it be physical or intellectual? And uh, please explain, elaborate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I would say yes. I would say yes in the exploration of, uh, you know, new territories. One thing, I just want to come back to my opening comments. And one thing, I mean, I guess, you know, we don't need to talk about this, but it, it, it preoccupies me a lot. I think about this distinction, and I think about earlier really we were talking about, you know, sailing, you know, these guys that got on ships and sail across the sea and found new lands and so on. And of course, I think about the parallels. But um, uh, the technology is what interests me now, the specific, and I think specifically here about Martin Heidegger's distinction between techne and technology. So he would say that, you know, a ship or a windmill or all these things, you know, that, that in the past has been glorious inventions are things that work with nature. You know, a ship with sails is working with the natural elements in order to, to do something. And he calls that an example of techne or technique. But technology is something different where you create machines, I mean, to really simplify this. Uh, and, and, and then he argues that this has actually has an impact on your consciousness. So that, um, so that what's going on in a technological conquest of space is in some ways similar to the colonization of the new world, but in some ways it's categorically different, and that is because of the artifice. That, and that's what I meant by the anthropomorphism of space exploration, that it's inconceivable that you could move to Mars, uh, you know, and, and still from America and stand on the deck and feel the sun on your back breathe in the clear air of the Niagara River, but you can't do that on Mars. So there's something different for me going on in that. I, I think because we're sitting here uh, talking in English and we're contemplating things that uh, have been done you know, by Europeans uh, in space, uh, obscures the fact that, in fact, many of the civilizations triumphs have been done by other people entirely. The Chinese had great expansionist policies back in the 1200s. They were all over the place, large ship, large fleets of ships going all over to go ahead and impress people about how important the Chinese Empire was and wouldn't you want to trade with us, etc. Uh, and at some point in time, a political decision was made to not do that anymore. So somebody won, somebody lost, Ships didn't go out anymore. And so the Chinese weren't doing that, so we couldn't actually point to them as the explorers that discovered the new world, even if they were already here before. And I think that you would look back at, you know, uh, say the stars. When you take a look at the stars in the sky, many of them, if not a vast majority, have Arabic names. And it's because the Arabs spent a lot of time studying the stars scientifically. My favorite is Zubin al by the way. But anyway, you know, it, it just, we forget that because we're at the crest of a wave and maybe uh, it's breaking a little bit of, you know, what happened from Europe. Uh, and people came here to get rid of their young sons and other things so that they, uh, you know, weren't hanging around the estate looking like they might want to take over. Um, and then you could grow corn and maybe you could grow tortillas and, you know, you could be happy. Or maybe you can grow tobacco and give everybody uh, you know, some kind of drug like that. That's what happened here. 
Um, I think if you look at the historical parallels to everything, uh, just because we're in this civilization now doesn't mean that other civilizations, the Chinese or the Mayans or the Mesopotamians, they didn't have their, their, their origination phase, they didn't have their growth phase, they didn't have their exploration phase, the, their maturity and, and, and their decline. And, and you know, at, at some point, our civilization is going to merge or change or move into something else. Uh, we're not special just because Western civilization seems to be on top today. Uh, it's just where we are now. Uh, and, and, and things will change the difference. And, 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 and I, I sort of think people are alike all over. Does that make sense? I mean, no, it's just that uh, what I was seeing. We're going to jump to We've got a lot of hands up. Oh, right. sorry. <laughs> we'll be trying to have first to try to get Yes, for that. Um, yeah, yeah. This is a question. Who owns Mars? Who owns Mars? You do. Mars. <laughs> 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 how do you see, how do you guys see the out, international outer space treaty holding up in the face of Mars exploration? What was the, the question to that? Oh, yeah, I know, no, I'll be, I mean, I would say that this is exactly, the, no, the, the, uh, the optimism in some, some of these panelists, you know, my fellow panelists, about, you know, a better world and international cooperation, so I'm not so skeptical of this. Think about the parallels between the United Nations and sovereign states, you know what I mean? The United Nations is a really good idea, but the United States doesn't belong to it, the most powerful country on earth, and it's completely ineffective in, in you know, in most quarters. So, we'll see how this would be resolved. That's why I raised the, the issue of John Locke in the 17th century. And you know, is do we think that's true? That if you fix your labor or something, if you get there first and you dig up the land or pitch your tent that it belongs to you, or you put your flag on it, remember the contest on the moon. So um, I think it, it's a huge question. And so raising these whole questions are human beings natural appropriators. That's why I raised the, the whole question about colonization and sovereignty, because as far as I know, human beings, there is no era, no people, no civilization um, in which people have not tried to establish sovereignty, including Aboriginal peoples, in different ways, right? So it's, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't see any kind of happy international cooperation if, if we were, in fact, to colonize. According to the treaty, it's the common heritage of mankind. Sorry, okay. but <laughs> the, the long and short of it is that everybody had known here on Mars. And one of the real pressing needs in space law is to figure out a way for future governance to take place uh, without actually voiding the Outer Space Treaty itself and coming up with something completely different. Something like a convention under the treaty to determine how they're going to make this all work and how somebody is going to give you the right to have a piece of Mars uh, is what is referred to sometimes as constructing a sovereign. We don't have one yet. We certainly don't have one that's got a bureaucracy. So we have to work on this. Just a second. Pardon? Yeah, sorry. Just quickly, what do we do about property rights? Do we have property rights in Mars? Do we have property rights in Mars? Do we have property rights in Mars? Do we ignore them? I technically own a piece of Mars and it was worth it here. Ask for it to be delivered. <laughs> I've had this debate with a, with a number of other people in the past. I think what's going to happen is that a lot of competing jurisdictions will grow up uh, over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, Cocos will, will uh, agree to one thing. I think the, the Outer Space Treaty will end up saying something else. The Americans will say something else. Uh, other companies, other countries will say other things. And I think the equivalency to the colonization and, and, and the dividing up of property on Mars is, is the same sort of thing that happened, say, during the California Gold Rush in 1848, when there were a variety of competing jurisdictions. The Mexicans thought they were in charge, the American federal government thought it was in charge, the American military thought it was in charge because they had just finished up the Spanish-American War, uh, various Native American tribes thought they were in charge. And what happened is the people who were there came up with the rules among themselves. And, and, and sometimes the rules didn't work, and sometimes the rules did work because I'm not, a, I'm not an idealist. I don't think our best and brightest are going to go. Uh, but I do think that we're all practical people, and, and, and if we want to 
if we want to preserve what we're trying to build, we're, we're likely going to cooperate. The details of that cooperation likely will not become clear until some of us are on Mars, but it will happen. We've got five more minutes, so we're going to try to squeeze in a few really quick questions, really quick answers, you can very patient. Go ahead. Yes? I want to know how far down the surface are we going to find underground rivers on Mars? Where will we find underground rivers, for those who can't hear the question? The, the, the answer to that is, of course, at the moment we don't know. We've not detected with radar any subterranean water flows. But uh, we've gone down, I guess, something like well, a couple of hundred meters with radar at this point in time. Uh, so I'm going to say below 200 meters. Uh, but we do occasionally, we've, we've commented on this briny, salty water and the ability for it to break out through vertical surfaces on the sides of hills, what they call the lineage. Uh, on uh, imagery from the Mars Reconnaissance Observer. So you, you can seemingly get the right conditions to exist very close to the surface, but they're not flowing rivers, they're not aquifers. So the answer to your question is at least 200 meters or more below the surface, if they're there at all. Question? Yes. I wrote, I wrote my question. In North America, over the last few years, there's been a large pressure to privatized space development, which will lead to a lot more private gain and more billionaires, influencing our democratic systems worldwide. Do you think in contrast to that, the Canadian public would be likely to support a space party in 2019, 2023, uh, if they had not planned to nationalize space <coughs> colonization? Uh, and do you think they would be as effective as the Green Party in raising space issues towards uh, conversation? He's asking about a space party in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> including batteries that fail. Dead, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> There's spare batteries on the podium, two to place. It's five out of nine, I don't know. He's telling us to get out. So I'm going to come up here and sure. look into that. I'm going to take one or two really quick questions, because I know there are a lot of hands that Yeah. <laughs> 
talking about germs, you're talking about germs, but the microbes actually make this planet operate. We have phytoplankton in the ocean, we have 
every kind of microbe that's ever been alive on this planet in the ocean or down under the ground, etc. Some of them are very prodigious. Some of them make food for every other kind of organism going up the food chain. Um, but effectively, they affect every process that goes on on this planet. If you go to the mid-ocean ridges, you can actually see the scars where microbes have started to eat the glass that comes out within 30 days of it cooling off enough. Microbes are eating this planet, microbes are making this planet happen, and there's no life on Earth without the microbial population on Earth. The biomass is half of the biomass that we see. So because we, they're small and we don't see them, we don't think about how they operate, but in fact, they make this planet work. On Mars, if there are microbes, they may make that planet work. There's a really fun group of organisms that live in a place called Rio Tinto in Spain. And without the organisms, that water would be a pH towards neutral 5 to 6. But because the microbes are there, it's a pH 2 or lower. They keep it as acid mine drainage in an area where otherwise it might not be so acid. They can control these things. Underground on Mars, there may be aquifers. They may have Mars organisms. They may not. But we have to be concerned about our own microbes because we know that they can seal off aquifers. And aquifers are a good thing for Mars colonies. If they're there operating the planet in a way that we don't understand because we haven't accounted for them, then that ignorance will not lead to bliss if we try to terraform the planet. It's not, it's out of respect more than reverence. It's been a real delight to moderate tonight's event. I want to thank all of you, especially for your excellent and enlightening questions, and to our panel uh, for bringing such diverse expertise, such eclectic expertise around one table. A round of applause for our panel.